I've entitled my thoughts this morning, Gentleness and Meekness to All, and we turn back to the book of Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, particularly today, verse 2. Let's read that together. Put them in mind, Paul writes to Titus, to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Last week we studied together verse 1 of this passage, and as it has been with a few of the passages in this particular study, when I approached it I thought we'll spend one message on verses 1 through 7, for instance, of this chapter, or perhaps in the previous chapter I intended when I first looked at the passage to begin in verse 11 and preach through verse 15 in one message alone, and one message became two, and two messages became three, and so it is with the verses that we've read for you today and we considered with you last week. There are so many important things that you can expound on and elaborate on in these phrases alone. You might look at it as that which is between the commas or between the periods, the marks of punctuation, that you really could stretch out even a short epistle that's only three chapters long to several months. You remember when we studied the book of 1 Corinthians together, that was many, many years ago, and, and many of you who are here today were not with us then. I think we spent 18 months in the book of 1 Corinthians. Why do we do that? Because the Word of God is to be preached. It's to be expounded upon, not just the parts of it that make us feel good, not just the parts of it that we like to hear because they really present the things that we believe about grace, but all of the Word of God, all of it. It's all needful to you. And so I'm thankful to slow down and consider some of these passages in a little more depth than maybe we would if we just blasted through it or ran through it. Our focus today is on verse 2, and we tell you up front that this is probably one of the most difficult subjects most of us that preach ever have to speak on. It's one that we feel that we don't live up to, and so when we introduce it for you today, just understand up front that as I share these thoughts with you, these are not things that I feel as if I have a corner of the market on. They're things that I struggle with in my ministry. They are things that I struggle with with my children and with my wife. They're things that I believe if we were to take a census or a survey of all here, we all struggle with what I'm going to talk to you about today, and that is being gentle and being meek to be gentle, and to be meek. Those particular traits are the ones that are highlighted in the passage that we read. Speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but be gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. We notice there in verse 2 a pattern that's so often repeated in the Word of God. When you're told not to do something, usually, many times, you're told to do something instead. I was talking to a pastor today about a man, or this week, about a man who in his neighborhood was arrested, and it's always interesting to look outside and see unmarked, casual clothes agents with pistols and badges on their side and bulletproof vests swarming a person's house. You always wonder what's, what's going on over there. But as he looked it up in the paper later, that man had been arrested for theft. And he said, you know, I'm going to invite him to church. And the thought occurred to me from 
a passage of Scripture, let him that stole steal no more, but rather work and give to those that don't have in their own life. Let him that stole steal no more, rather work and give. In Scripture, we have so many don'ts that are followed by a do. Instead of doing this, do that. You replace one behavior with another behavior. Here in Titus 3.2, Speak evil of no man, but to be, brought, uh, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. These words gentleness and meekness are ones that I think that we're so familiar with. We've heard messages our entire lives on the subject of meekness. We know that Jesus himself said, I am meek and lowly, but they're words that sometimes it's helpful to hear a simple definition on. To, be, to have gentleness as a trait simply means to be a gentle person. You're mild. You're not one who is harsh with others. And likewise, the word meekness here, I am meek and lowly, Jesus said in Matthew 11, means, conveys first of all humility. If a person is meek, that person is not arrogant or egotistical. To be meek is to be humble. But at the same time, the word meekness and meek can be defined as a lack of self-will. In the Oxford English Dictionary, that word in English can be defined as lack of self-will. Well, which is it? Is it humble or is it a lack of self-will? Those two concepts go so hand in hand. A humble man is going to say, well, sure there are things that I want in the world, but I understand that maybe my wife and my children have greater needs Maybe it's something that I want, but it's not what God's will for me is at this present time. And so whatever God's will is, that's what I want to be done. Whatever's best for my family, whatever's best for those that are around me in my community or in my church. And so meekness, being lack of self-will, goes right along with humility because the humble person is going to walk in a lack of self-will. What he wants or she wants isn't the number one thing in the world at that moment in time. And so you have gentleness, being gentle, and meekness, humility, or a lack of self-will. Scripturally, gentleness stands in contrast to wrath or harshness. At one point in the week, I was tempted to present to you everything that the Proverbs had to say about being full of wrath. Sometimes we as men say, well, I've got a temper. That's just who I am. I was born with it. There's really not a whole lot I can do about it. But Proverbs would call on us to temper that, no pun intended. We're to control ourselves in our anger because anger is destructive and a man who deals with anger, well, it's easy to take over a walled city than it is for an individual that's driven by anger to control himself. And so we need to avoid anger and harshness, wrath. As we think about being gentle, again, in contrast with gentleness, which is what we should do, you have harshness. Now, I think if I were to ask again everyone here, have you been harsh with your children this week? Most of us would probably say yes. In fact, this morning, maybe at about 8.45, just as a rough estimate, we can be harsh with their little ones. We can be harsh as husbands with our wives. Ben, would you go out there and cut the backyard? It's got all the winter weeds that you didn't round up when it I round up the front yard because I want it to look good. I don't care about the backyard. You know, the Bermuda goes dormant, you kill everything else, and then you don't have to cut grass till like April. It's great. It's awesome. Well, I didn't do anything to the backyard, so, you know, three or four times this week, will you cut the backyard? I don't want to cut the backyard. Would you cut the backyard? I don't care about the backyard. It's got winter weeds. They'll die when it gets hot. Well, there are times that when I'm asked those questions in the home, men, just like all of you, that my response back is a little too harsh than it ought to be when Scripture calls on me to be more of a gentle person than it does a harsh person. As we consider a few of the thoughts up front, we'll look at, again, the exceptions to the rule, times that we might be stern, we might be a little more forceful, we might be a little gruff, but I'll just tell you, husbands, that's not to your wives, it's not to your children's wives, it's not to your children or your husband. And it's not to our brothers and sisters in the church, but we ought to be people who epitomize 
Christian maturity, which is to be meek and humble and gentle, kind and Christ-like to those that we come in contact with. Whereas gentleness stands in contrast to harshness or to anger, meekness stands against arrogance and pride. We use the word pride today in our country in particular to have reference to gratitude, and it's always been so ironic to me that we'll sing, I'm proud to be an American, and what we mean by that is not what the Bible means by pride. We mean that I'm thankful and I'm grateful and I'm enthusiastic to be an American citizen. But when Scripture uses pride, it doesn't mean what we mean when we tell our little boy at the end of the day after he's played his heart out in a game, I'm proud of the way that you played, which means I'm satisfied, I'm grateful, I'm appreciative. No, pride in the Bible means that I look at some other person as if I am better than them. Now, As we begin to develop the thought that's in this passage, much with what we considered last week, it's built on a principle of grace. For we ourselves were also one time, and what were we at one time? Dead in trespasses and in sins. The person who understands total depravity should never, ever Look at another person as if he or she is better than them. I was watching a conversation unfold this past week on a social media group, and in this group there was a a believer, a more orthodox believer, who had a family member who had announced and proclaimed that this individual male associates with some agendas in the world that we would consider to be very sinful, and One of the comments that was made was so very touching. One of the people said, you know, as folks who believe in the doctrines of grace, it helps you. It it is a deliverance to you because you can approach this sin issue in this person's life. And I'm hinting about what it is. You can probably imagine. You can approach this sin issue in this life without being judgmental in the sense of I am better than you. You should be better so you're like me because you understand that without grace, that's exactly where you would be. Understanding grace, what I was by nature and what God has done for me stops me from being a judgmental person or it ought to because I know without grace, that's exactly what I would be. I would be just that sinful and behave in such a sinful way. As we think about a few thoughts up front, as we just said, this principle is based on the grace of God. What we are now versus what we were before the Lord Jesus came into our lives. I love to think about that in the sense of the way we think of time. Human history is divided into two eras, before Christ and the year of our Lord. The coming of Christ into the world even split the calendar. It's divided the Word of God into two portions. You have the Old Testament, what led up to Christ, and you have the New Testament that is in reply to the coming of Christ. In our lives, each and every one of us has a personal B.C. and a personal A.D. And you might think, I've loved Jesus my entire life. I was a little three-year-old child sitting on the front pew on my grandparents' knee singing, How sweet the name of Jesus sounds. Even so, there was a period of time in your life when you were an alien from God. You were dead in trespasses and in sins. Even if you loved him as far back as your memory takes you, there was a point at some time in your life when he came into your heart and he changed you. Now, why do I emphasize perhaps a time before you were born? There are many people in the world, who do not remember when God came into their life and changed them. They can remember loving the Lord and fearing Him and believing in Him all the way back into childhood. You know what's so strange? There are people in this world that would look at them and say, well, they never accepted Jesus, they're not going to heaven. No, they love Jesus. Let me just give you the rule. If you love Jesus, whether you've gone through some man-made step or not, if you love Jesus, you're a heaven-bound person. You love him because he first loved you, and if he loved you, you're going to be with him in glory. 
And it's that simple. Some people are born again at such a young age, they don't remember their life before Christ. But that doesn't mean they didn't have a life before Christ. Every one of us is conceived in sin and shaped in iniquity. There's a period of our lives when we don't know Jesus. And he comes into our heart. He bursts in. You know, people say he's standing at the door and knocking, but I can show you scripture where Jesus just appears in the midst of them in a locked room. He doesn't need permission. He doesn't ask. He raises the dead from their death and trespasses and in sins. And it's why we're all here this morning because as we'll see next week in the verses after this, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. That's my story. That's your story. Amen. There was a man in the Bible named John the Baptist, and he leapt for joy in his mother's womb when the mother of Christ came into the room. But even in the life of John the Baptist, there was a period of time before the Spirit sanctified him, as it were, in his mother's womb, because he, like all of us, was conceived in sin. There was only one individual in the history of creation who was conceived without sin, and that man was the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, what about Adam? Adam wasn't conceived. He was formed out of the dust of the ground. But our Lord Jesus Christ, the Eternal Son of God, the Holy Spirit did conceive him in the womb of a virgin named Mary, and he's the only one without a sin nature. Every single one of us are conceived in sin and shaped in iniquity. And so because of that, we are natural-born sinners. Every one of us has a BC. And if you love the Jesus, you're if you're if you love Jesus, you're living in the AD. The year of our Lord, as it were, in your own personal life. Christ has taken up residence in you. If I was once foolish, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy and hateful and hating one another, if I was once that way and God has saved me, it ought to do two things at least. Number one, it ought to, I ought to endeavor to walk in a different set of behaviors than I walked in in my personal BC. If I have been saved by the grace of God, I ought to endeavor to walk in that grace, wherein I stand, according to the book of Romans. It ought to make a change in my life. I ought to want to do better. I've got a nature that desires it. I ought to bring my mind in accord with that nature and mortify the flesh each and every day of my life. Number two, if I have been saved by the grace of God, I ought to throw a mantle of charity on others who are where I used to be. As we've already said, if I was once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another then I ought to throw a mantle of charity on people who are also now presently living in that lifestyle because that's exactly what God rescued me from, not by anything that I have done, as he says in the following verse, not by works of righteousness which we have done. Somebody once made the, the remark in a sermon that we come into our churches on a Sunday morning. Sometimes we hear how low down, despicable, and wretched we are by nature. We all amen, hug each other, smile, and leave. And you'd think that makes absolutely no sense. Well, to the carnal mind, it doesn't, which is why the gospel is foolish to him. And we're not glorying in our sinfulness, but understanding what we were by nature and what God has done for us changes the way we think about this world, the way we think about ourselves, and the way we think about others. I hope when I read that we, are, we were foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another, that no one was offended and thought, how dare he say that about me? But I trust every single one of you in this room thought, that's right, that's me by nature, that's me without Christ, that's me before Christ, and that would be me today if Christ had never changed me. 
It really is amazing when you think about the fact that we could come into a room, hear how despicable we are by nature, and go away rejoicing. Now, in this life only we had hope in Christ, we would be of all men most miserable. The reason we rejoice is because we're delivered from it, because we glory in what Christ has done for us. And it is a glorious thing. The book of Romans chapter 2 gives us a principle that we can apply to this. If I judge another and I'm guilty of what I'm judging them for, my judgment on that matter actually condemns myself. Paul goes to elaborate lengths to expand on that in Romans chapter 2, and I'll leave that for you to pursue on your own time as a homework assignment. But suffice it to say, if, if I judge you for committing a sin that I have committed and I struggle with, while I'm judging you, I'm actually condemning myself. Understanding that I was foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers, lusts, and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another, then I ought not be harsh to people. I ought to be gentle and kind to be no brawler, to speak evil of no man, but to show all meekness to all men, as Paul says in verse 2 of Titus chapter 3. So as we give you some thoughts up front, number one, this principle is based on grace, and because this principle is based on grace, it changes the way we understand and perceive and navigate the world around us. Point number two, as we consider some thoughts up front, And I've given you, I'll give you this little statement just to help you think about it. I want you to think along the, the lines of fists versus words. Fists versus words. When Paul says to be no brawlers, he has more in mind than going out into the road and getting into a knockdown, drag out fist fight with someone. We can be brawlers with our words. This warning about brawling and encouragement to be gentle and meek applies to physical fighting, sure. But it also applies even more so to our words and the things that we say as we read, to speak evil of no man, but to be gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. You might say, and so many times the Pharisees and the Jews and the scribes would come to Jesus, and they would say, he would present a, a scripture, take the rich young ruler for instance, Master, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, first of all, you don't do good things to inherit something. You inherit something because someone else died and left it to you. You don't inherit eternal life by the good things that you do. But Jesus says, oh, you know the law. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't covet. And the man says, all these things have I observed from my youth. I've never broken the Ten Commandments. And Jesus tells him, one thing you lack. Go sell everything that you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. And that man went away sorrowful because he couldn't turn loose of his stuff. What is Jesus doing? Telling him that only people who sell everything and swear a vow of poverty can go to heaven? No. He's telling him that one thing he lacks, and it doesn't matter who you are, one thing you lack. They came to him, and they had deceived themselves into thinking that they were not guilty of violating these laws. You might have heard no brawlers and thought, well, I haven't been in a fist fight since I was in sixth grade. But we can be brawlers with our words. We can be brawlers with our tongues, with our speech. What this passage has to convey to us today has as much to do with what we say as it does what we do with our fists and our feet. I made the remark a few weeks ago, when you grew up without the internet and screens and YouTube and all these various apps, little boys would be so bored they'd go outside and fist fight and have something to do. We, there wasn't a boy on the road that I didn't get in a fist fight with, including my own little brother. 
I got a chipped tooth right here where he kicked me in the mouth and he lost his first tooth when I punched it out of his head. <laughs> Grew up brawling, scrappy little Winslet barefoot kids. But this has so much more application than simply punching somebody in the nose. To be no brawlers, yes, with our fists, but also with our words. I'm going to notice briefly the book of James chapter 3. And do more reading than I do commenting. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. There are two opinions of that or understandings of that text that you read in commentaries and study Bibles, etc. Be not many masters, knowing we shall receive the greater condemnation. Could be saying, beware if you want to be a Bible teacher, if you want to be a pastor, if you want to be an elder, because you will be judged more harshly for your failures than the average person sitting on the pew. Be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. The other opinion of that is to be careful before you put yourself up in a position of Lord over other people, because as we read in the Sermon on the Mount, as we read in Romans chapter 2, if I become a judge over other people, I am opening up the door for divine judgment. When I judge, the same judgment shall be meted to me, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Or perhaps to quote the model prayer and give you the opposite of, opposite of that, forgive me as I what? As I forgive my debtors, as I forgive them that sin against me. There is a direct correlation with the way I judge and treat others and the way God deals with me as a son. Now pay very careful attention to that last phrase in that sentence. God doesn't deal with you as with condemned criminals. God deals with you as with sons. And so if I'm unforgiving to people around me, God is less forgiving to me as a son, and he chastens me more, more harshly in my own personal life. We're not talking about I've got to forgive everybody that ever wronged against me or when I go to heaven, I'm just going to be told, get out of here and go to the other place because you're too unforgiving. This is dealing with God's children under the umbrella, if you will, of God's parental chastening and daily with his children. This is an experimental or experiential lesson and not an eternal lesson. This isn't affecting your standing in grace, but your day-to-day -day life. If I am forgiving, God is gentler to me. If I am more harsh, God will be more harsh with me. Very consistent biblical principle. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend. If any man offend not in word... The same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. He's going to give us some examples here in a minute. Fire, weaponry, warfare. There are people in the world and you think, that fella does not need a match, he does not need a lighter. He's going to burn down the house, the subdivision, the forest, and probably the town. Every single one of us in this room has a tongue and the tongue is more dangerous. When we say tongue, we have reference to the words that we say. When we speak, the power that comes in our words. When I was a little boy, it was commonly said, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words shall never hurt me. Did you know that's a lie? Did you know words can hurt? Words can hurt people. And I ought not use my words as a weapon against other people. It breaks their heart. Some of the most painful images that I've ever seen in memes on social media, somebody takes a picture of a little kid and you got all of these daggers and arrows and knives sticking out of them and everyone has another label that someone has called them. Damaging a little one at a young age by the mean things that are said to them. It's just, it's just terrible. It ought not be. 
It's a weapon that every one of us is born with. Think about it. Even in the armor of God, the sword of the Spirit, the weapon is the Word of God, which we preach and proclaim in the spiritual warfare. Our weaponry is our words. How that wicked one can capitalize and injure people by the things that are said. If any man offend not in word the same as a perfect man, he is able to bridle his whole body. The hardest part of you to control as far as physical, of course your mind is difficult to control, but the hardest part of you as far as you interacting with the outside world to control is your tongue. And if you can control the things that you say, well, you can control the entire body. Behold, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. I challenge you to go try to wrestle a horse. You're not going to win. They are intensely strong. And yet that great beast can be maneuvered about by a frail man or even a little child simply because the bit is in its mouth. Behold also the ships which, though they be so great, are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. You've got these giant sea vessels in Paul's day that are powered by the wind. And in the back of it, you have the very small, very small helm, as he calls it. I suppose, what is it? We call it a rudder. What is the, the thing that moves? I don't have a boat. The only boat I have is the one I painted that's hanging on my office wall. I don't like water because you can't see through it, and I don't know what's under it. I love swimming pools. I can see my feet. I get into the ocean about up to half up my shin. Rachel and the kids are out there on sandbars swimming with sharks. I'm over here like, you are crazy. I love y'all, but I'm not going out there. Anyway, I don't know anything about boats. But he says, the governor uses this helm, a very small part of a boat, to control where it goes. And think about it, it's driven by the very power of the wind itself. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. This past year, 2020, among the many 2020-ings that occurred was... A million acres burning out west. One of our beloved families here, the Reardons, will tell you about their home that used to be in California that they moved to come here in Huntsville, Alabama. And some of those fires over the past couple of years destroyed the entire subdivision. Everything that they left behind, that home, burned to the ground. Behold, what great a matter a little fire kindleth. Think about the blazing forest fires out west where it's dry, that begin with just a single, a single ember. Maybe someone throws a cigarette outside their car window and it lands and burns down hundreds of thousands of acres. Think about all the commotion that can begin with, with such a short thing as a cruel word. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members. It defileth the whole body, setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. Hell fire is in the tongue. What is the influence when people say things that are mean? Well, it's definitely not divine. He goes on, Every kind of beast and bird and serpent and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. Right before the Barnum and Bailey Circus closed, we took our children, except for Ethan, to it. When Lydia was a little baby, we took Ethan and Lydia and went to the circus. And I can remember a time when I was a little boy and went to the circus, how just magical It was to go see everything that there was to see at the circus. But the most terrifying thing to me as a dad with a bunch of little children, and because of this, we sit really high in the balcony. You've got lions and tigers and 
this little man in a cage with a whip cracks that whip and those lions and those tigers, they might snarl and growl, but they obey him and in a sense they are tamed of him. And I'm just thinking, those lions, you are in a cage with lions. I don't want to be in a cage with chihuahuas, I don't know. I was reading pyrometers one time in college and the door opens and 15 chihuahuas come out the door and start biting my feet and my pants and tore holes in my pants. I thought, who bred these evil little demons? Thank the Lord they're so small. Could you imagine if they were larger? It'd be like velociraptors. What an attitude. This man's in a cage with lions and they're obeying him. Elephants line up around the room and jump up and put their front legs on the, the hind end of the other elephants and they do that in a row and they bow and they do all kinds of other things. All sorts of animals have been tamed by mankind. But what does he say? But the tongue can no man tame. It's easier to train a pack of lions than it is to get control of the things that we say. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so be. Now you say, well, maybe he's only talking about your fellow believers. No. Notice when he appeals to a biblical principle, he doesn't appeal to the cross, but the Garden of Eden. We bless God and curse men, men which are made after the similitude of God. In other words, I ought to be careful the way I talk about men, not because merely that they might be my brethren in Christ. Well, certainly but because back at the beginning of time, God made man in his own image. Now, there's a principle in this that applies to our everyday lives. Why is it okay to slaughter a cow and eat a hamburger, but it's wrong to kill a baby? Because the cow isn't made in the image of God. The baby is. And so it is wrong to take the life of an unborn child because he's made in the image of God. Now, let me say one that offends people on the other side of the aisle. If we have people in our country who sneak in here to better themselves, we ought not treat them like they're less than human as we apprehend them and even if we send them back. Why? Because they're made in the image of God just like we are. We ought to treat all men with dignity and compassion and respect. Even people who are living in lifestyles that are contrary to the word of God. Which is where we'll end up today in our message. Men and women, people, are to be treated with dignity and respect because they are made in the image of God. uses the example of a fountain. Does a fountain send sweet and bitter water at the same time? The answer to that is no. It sends what it sends, whether sweet or bitter. And so our mouths should be fountains of grace, fountains of mercy, fountains of kindness and charity and gentleness. Now, I began today by saying that this convicts me a whole lot more than it probably convicts you. It hits me before it hits you because I've had to prepare for this message all week. And as I say it, if it steps on your toes, understand that if I step on your toes, my feet are bruised because it hits me just as it does you. But we ought to be careful the way that we talk. I wrote a bunch of things down on the outline. We don't need to be rude. We don't need to be harsh. Here's a word that I appreciate and enjoy using. We don't need to be snarky. Think about the woman that comes to Jesus at the well and Jesus talks to her and she begins to argue with him and 
If there was a word that described her, it would be snarky. We don't need to be snarky. Even when we tease, we need to be careful that when we're being playful with other people, that it doesn't hurt the person's feelings. Suffice it to say, there, there's never a time to be a jerk. There's never a time to be a mean girl. I gave you a masculine and a feminine. No time to be a jerk. No time to be a mean girl. Control the things that we say. Lastly, and these are the thoughts up front. It happens. I'm sure that we're all familiar with the proverb that was popularized by President Teddy Roosevelt. To speak softly and carry a big stick. He called it an African proverb. He was a man that spent much time hunting game and Africa back before they tried to make you out to be an evil person for doing such a thing as that. It's always amazing the people who think you can kill unborn babies think it's wrong to go hunt an animal. And I don't want to abuse animals and I don't want to hunt animals to extinction. But just speaking as Americans, it's hard to find people who want deer more than deer hunters. We have extraordinary conservation departments in our states. Anyway. Speak softly and carry a big stick. As a a reminder, people slew giants by faith. People, according to Hebrews chapter 11, repelled invading militaries by faith. People escaped violence by faith, quenched fire by faith, People stand and proclaim the truth of God's word by faith. This isn't teaching us to be weak. It isn't teaching us to be wimpy. It isn't teaching us to roll over. No, quite the contrary. We are to be bold as Christ was bold. The same Jesus that we love and adore, twice in his ministry, went into the temple flipped the tables over on which the money changers exchanged currency, drove all the animals out from the gates, made a whip and chased the men out who exchanged money and who bought and sold in the temple. The same Jesus that we love was as ferocious as a lion to the Pharisees and the scribes in Matthew 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees! How shall you being evil escape the damnation of hell? But that Jesus, that blessed Jesus, was as gentle as a lamb to little troubled sinners who recognized their sinfulness, who sorrowed over their sin. He was as kind and gentle to them as a meek and lowly lamb. As we think about the value of gentleness, I'm going to share with you three principles along those lines before getting to the last three principles that we want to share with you today. This could be three sermons. Number one, gentleness diffuses hostile situations. If you have a situation and hostility and tensions are rising, one of the two of you has to extinguish the situation, the fire, as it were, before it gets out of hand. And I challenge each and every one of you to be that person. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 1, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Proverbs talks a lot about the tongue and words and anger and gentleness and compassion. A soft answer turneth away wrath. Gentleness diffuses situations. Maybe you could think about Romans chapter 12 and verse 20. We quoted this passage recently when we talked about the fact that God alone has the right to avenge. Vengeance belongs unto him, meaning if I take it, I'm stealing from him. Avenge not yourselves, Romans 12, 19. Give place unto wrath, it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. 
For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. You may think that sounds painful. How many of you still have a wood-burning fireplace? This is a new thing to me. I pulled the gas logs out because we couldn't get gas before that ice storm that they thought was going to happen, and it never did. Here, anyway. And I burned wood all week. I felt like I was in 1850. It was awesome. Sit around that, smelling like smoke, watching the fire blaze, drinking coffee. It was great. I've since evolved to fire logs because you light the paper and it does it and then it goes away. Hot coals you heap on their head. Depending on the perspective, you might burn them by being kind to them. But at the same time, you might melt them. John Trapp in his commentary points out that you, to your enemies, when you're kind to them, when you're gentle to them, you heap coals of fire on their head, melting them and perhaps even gaining a friend that you'll have for the rest of your life. You melt them, as it were. How do you know if it's going to melt them or if it's going to burn them? Well, it depends on the material. Remember when we talked about Pharaoh, the same heat that hardens the clay melts the wax. It depends on what the substance is that you're dealing with. It depends on the condition of the heart that you're dealing with. But it doesn't change what you do. We're to be kind. Their reaction is on them. Number two, the value of gentleness. It's more winsome. Winsome is an interesting word. I like to break it into two. Win some. You win people over. Being gentle is more winsome. Think about it this way. The old saying goes, you catch more flies with honey than you do vinegar. There's a value to being sweet. Even in the previous chapter, Paul says to speak the things which what sound doctrine? Become it. Make it beautiful. Make it attractive. That's what the word winsome means, to make something appear attractive. Gentleness is more winsome than harshness. We're far more likely to gather folks into our church with gentleness and meekness than we would harshness. Number three, gentleness along with meekness places God's will at the forefront rather than our own opinions. Because to be meek is a lack of self-will. It's not my opinion that I'm asserting. I'm not defending what I believe. I'm simply telling you what God has said. And I can do that a lot more gentle than I can share with you my opinion that I might very hotly believe. All right. As we think about gentleness as a trait, I want to emphasize gentleness for a few moments. First of all, we are to be gentle to those who are within. What do you mean by within? I mean among our ranks in the church. Turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul speaking about his time of ministry with the Thessalonians. He has now gone. He went there. The people in the community began to persecute the Christians in Thessaloniki. Paul flees town. There was much persecution there. But he refers back to his time with them. Our exhortation was not of deceit, nor uncleanliness, nor in guile. We meant it. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. Neither at any time use we flattering words, as you know, for a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. We didn't flatter you to get money from you. Nor of men saw we glory. We didn't go to glorify ourselves. Neither of you yet of others when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. Paul taught the financial support of the ministry in 1 Corinthians 9, 1 Timothy 5, but he says, I didn't use any of those things. I went and I preached and I left. I'm not after anything except your benefit in the gospel. Verse 7. Read it with me. But we were gentle among you, 
even as a nurse cherisheth her children. When the Apostle Paul uses the word nurse right here, he has reference to a nursing mother. That's something that's taboo in our country. We don't talk about it. We don't think about it. We don't want to look at it. Let me just tell you that this is the way babies ate until recent times. Babies ate when they nursed. Without nursing, babies didn't eat. So there was nothing perverse about that. It was how you fed babies. When you go to a farm and all the little farm animals are nursing from their mother, you don't think, oh, how gross and perverse is that? You think the babies are eating. That's what we should think about when mothers nurse their babies. you got nursing moms all through the Bible, by the way. Jesus even references it before the destruction of Jerusalem. Woe unto the women that nurse in that day. Why? Because they're going to have to flee out of the holy city and hide in the wilderness. Well, yeah, I'd feel sorry for them too. Woe unto the women that are pregnant with child in that day. Imagine having to escape Jerusalem and flee into the mountains at eight and a half months. Ooh, that would be terrible. I know ladies that try to time when they're carrying babies on not being eight months in the middle of the summer. I'm seeing some heads go, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of what we try to do. We don't want to be carrying a baby in the middle of the summer. It's misery. As we think about this, think about the most tranquil scene that you can imagine. Maybe a slow rain. You hear it landing on the roof. You just want to take a nap. Dad always called that sleeping weather. As a land surveyor for 10 years of my life, that was sleeping weather. Sit in the work truck as the rain hits and just take a nap and rest your eyes. Because you got there at daylight and you leave when the sun went down. You might think of a mild breeze. Outside today, there was just a nice, mild breeze on this beautiful, beautiful spring day. Maybe some calm waters or a slow stream. Paul gives one of the most tranquil scenes in the world to compare his role as a minister, a nursing mom. You know, usually before the baby's nursed, it's not such a tranquil scene, right? Right? Three in the morning, why are you awake? Why are you screaming? But within minutes, that little baby begins to eat, and it's one of the most peaceful scenes that you'll ever witness. He says, as a nurse cherisheth her children, so were we among you with the gospel. It was as if he's feeding them milk like children, is the metaphor. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. That's how much he loved them. But Paul was gentle to those who are within. There are times in a man's ministry where he just has to put his foot down and say, enough. And I've been there. But... We need to understand these are God's little children and we need to be gentle with them and kind to them and compassionate to them like a mama who's nursing her babies. We need to be gentle. Also, and lastly along the lines of gentleness, we need to be gentle to those who are without. Second Timothy, Paul would talk about in verse Chapter 2 and verse 24, The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. These are those without. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. By the way, any time anyone has ever repented of anything, God has granted unto them repentance. From that very first moment of contrition that happens when you're born of the Spirit to your own daily life, today, yesterday, tomorrow, when you feel contrition, remorse over something that you did that you know was wrong, that feeling is of God. God grants to us repentance. And as ministers, we, with gentleness 
in meekness, see how they're coupled again? Instruct those that oppose themselves. Did you know someone, someone who hates the gospel, someone who even hates Christ, in a sense opposes themselves? What they believe is contrary to reality, who they are, what they are, at minimum, as a creature made in God's own image, or even a child of God who is living in a way that is contrary to the Word of God, or maybe even hates parts of the Word of God, like the doctrines of grace. Have you ever met a Christian that despised the doctrines of grace? They oppose themselves. The very grace that saved them, they think is somehow wrong. And we are to instruct those that oppose themselves in all gentleness and meekness. Peradventure, God gives them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Our job is to simply, with all meekness, but with all boldness, proclaim God's word. The repentance business, that's God's business. I can't. Boy, what a burden is that off your shoulders. I can't give someone repentance. I cannot make them repent. But I'm to instruct them in case God, peradventure, grants unto them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Lastly, as we think about being gentle and meek to all men, and we referenced this a moment ago, I want us to think about our example, Jesus Christ. He's our example of everything. Now, Paul's our example, but he says to follow me as I follow Christ. I'm an ensample to the flock, but only in so much as I follow Christ. There are times that Jesus was ferocious as a lion, but to the trembling, troubled, guilt-laden sinner, people I trust like you and me, he was kind, he was compassionate, He was gentle. He was so reassuring. I was thinking and reading this week about so many different people with so many different infirmities that would come to Jesus. They would tear holes in roofs to get through to him. They would climb sycamore trees to see him. They would burst through the crowd to grab the back of his garment. And to none of them did he say, go on. Live with the consequences of your actions. I never knew you. Oh, there are people that he will say that to at the end of time. The Matthew 23 charlatans, but not to those troubled sinners who wept. Thy faith has made thee whole. Be healed. Every single time. May we go and do likewise as our Savior, Christ Jesus, has done for us, understanding what he has done for us. May we be gentle and meek. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the example your son has set. Thank you for these scriptures. We know, Lord, that this is a hard saying. Who can do it? But, Father, through the grace of God, we can do all things through our Savior, Christ Jesus. May we be gentle, even when we have to be firm, Even when we have to be bold, let it not be about us. Let it never be done through anger or malice or strife or envy. May we serve you, Lord, in gentleness and humility and meekness. Help us to be like our Savior, Lord. Help us to know, as he knew situations, to know when to be bold. Because Lord knows there are times that the money changers' tables have to be flipped. But we recognize, Father, that that was your house and your son, and we are not. Lord, help us to be like he was, gentle and meek and compassionate and reassuring. Help this Father to be a part of our church's personality. Help it to be a consistent part of the pulpit. We ask, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Praise God from whom all